uh, as you have seen from the title, this webinar is about the DDGS for Animal Feed Opportunities and Challenges. And it's a knowledge sharing webinar. As we have seen the, the need for more new resources, uh, new sources for animal feed in the, in the growing livestock sector. I'm pleased to inform you all that we have a very esteemed uh, speakers and the panelists with us. And uh, without, uh, I would also like to share with you all that uh, we have got a very good response to the, this call uh, for the speaker uh, for this webinar. Almost uh, 450 registrations are there. Uh, and from all sectors, whether it is scientists, academia, nutritionists, poultry, feed producers, and from the government and dairy sector. Uh, so without uh, taking too much time, I would like to start straight away into the program. Uh, we have the first presentation from Dr. S. S. Patabi Rama, who is the chief nutritionist in Nanda Group. He will be introducing us to the context of the whole meeting and uh, give an overview of the DDGS for animal feed. Over to you, Dr. Patabi. Dr. Patabi is a very esteemed uh, nutritionist and uh, thank you for agreeing to share and initiate this webinar. Over to you, sir. Please share your slides. Thank you, Dr. Viva Ahuja. And uh, good evening to each and everyone here. So this today's topic uh, is a more relevant topic uh, in the present situation because where the raw material prices are going high. So we need to look at the alternate feed ingredients. So thanks for the introduction once again. I am Dr. Patabi, group, uh, group nutritionist, Nanda Group. So uh, based out of Bangalore. Your slides are visible, sir. Yeah. One minute. My screens are not moving. Let me let me just one minute. Is the screen visible now? Yes, sir, it is visible. Okay. Okay. Coming to our country, India, we are the one of the largest countries in the world. We are and we the area is very huge, 32.87 lakh square kilometers with a population of 138 crores. And most important is 70% of the Indians are non-vegetarians. In, in, many, in many other countries, they feel that India is a vegetarian country, but it's not the case. So coming to the productions of uh, animal origin, we are the number one in the world as far as the milk production is concerned, with 210 million metric tons per annum. And aquaculture, we are the second largest uh, producer in the world with 5.5 million metric tons of fish and about 0.8 million metric tons of shrimp, third largest in the egg production, and the fifth largest in the broiler meat production. So here, see, if you see the broiler meat production and aquaculture, that is fish, it's almost similar. So fish production is also much higher than what we were actually thinking. This I got this information from USEC when I was recently discussing with them. And coming to the animal population, so we are the largest, uh, uh, we have the largest population of buffaloes in the world, 110 million buffaloes, 193 million tons of cattle, and sheep and goat put together, it's more than 200 uh, million counts, and then 9 million of pigs, and the 852 million poultry, which includes both broilers and layers, at any point of time, we will be having around 850 million poultry population. Uh, coming to the feed production, uh, see our annual production is around 45 million metric tons. We produce about 12 to 13 million metric tons of cattle feed. 
and uh, broiler feed about 13 to 14 million tons, layer feed 12 to 13 million tons. And if you see here, aqua feed 2 to 3 million metric tons. Though we produce 5.5 million metric tons of fish, the majority of the fish farmers are still doing the uh, conventional type of feeding, like they feed rice bran, groundnut, etc. If they also adopt the scientific feeding methods, the aqua feeds volumes also will go up. Like in broilers, say 13 tons, so aqua feed also will go up. So as far as the growth is concerned, Indian dairy industry is growing at 5.8% per annum and poultry is growing at 78% per annum. So all this background, why I am telling is, so we have a huge requirement of animal feeds. So with this huge requirement of animal feeds and which is growing, so their future requirement of raw materials will be higher. So, and then uh, see dairy and poultry is growing at uh, say around 68% as against the agriculture, which is at the rate of only 2%. So there will be a gap between the demand and the supply. So, and this next thing is now here in India, uh, ethanol production government is encouraging a lot. And now at present, ethanol is produced using mainly the sugarcane and molasses, which now will switch over to grains, cereals like maize and rice broken, which a uh, central government has approved to use these cereals in biofuel production. And as all of us are know that DDGS is a co-product of ethanol production, and it's a very good source of protein as well as energy. And it has really a great potential of uh, replacing uh, to a larger extent both maize and soybean meal. So, and uh, using of the alternate raw materials will become inevitable in the future where, where, where the availability of raw materials will be a big question mark. So this is how the distillery dried grains with solubles uh, look like. Uh, so I have shown both maize and rice DDGS. Uh, See so the left hand where I have shown in green is the uh, properly cooked uh, uh, maize DDGS and the overcooked is uh, shown in red. Similarly, the rice DDGS, these are the pictures, actual pictures. So DDGS and ethanol, the present status. So globally, USA is the largest producer of the ethanol followed by Brazil. And uh, mainly they use the corn and they export it to more than 50 countries worldwide. In India, 90% of the ethanol is being produced by sugarcane and molasses, whereas only 10% right now is being produced using the cereals. And as I told you earlier, the government is encouraging to use uh, both maize and rice broken for ethanol production. And the present blending of ethanol in the petrol is about 10%. And we are targeting to go up to 20% by 2025. This is as per the National Policy on Biofuels uh, 2020, uh, as per the Niti Ayo. And then definitely the availability of DDGS will increase uh, as uh, year on year. The present facts about DDGS is that uh, there is a huge variation in the composition uh, of the proximate composition as well as the nutrient digestibility. And because of the, this uh, nutritionists are taking a very conservative value of metabolizable energy as well as the digestible amino acids. And they hesitate to include at a higher level. They hardly include at two to three percent. And the third risk is the high mycotoxin, especially in the maize DDGS. The mycotoxin in the DDGS will be three to four times higher than the actually in the grains. And the lack of knowledge about the good ethanol plants and the processing methods. Many of the consumers, like the nutritionists like me, 
we, we don't have the proper knowledge of the ethanol production process. And uh, see, totally, globally, whatever the DDGS is being produced, 75 to 80% goes for the ruminant feeds and only 10 to 15% in pigs and hardly 5 to 7% is being used in poultry because poultry birds are very sensitive. So nutritionists don't want to take risk with these high mycotoxins and the variable levels of the nutrients. So in India, now 90%, as I told, 90% is the sugar-based and 10% is cereal-based, which in future is going to shift to 50% and with the government encouraging the production using cereals, so a lot of broken rice and maize will go for production of ethanol and then DDGS will be available. This is just to show the a process of production of DDGS. It's basically the grinding of grinding, then it's basically the fermentation. After the fermentation, there will be distillation where ethanol will be uh, after the, the ethanol is uh, taken out uh, by distillation and then whatever the solids are left out. See, we have two types of solids there. One is the uh, bigger solids and then the second is the, the small stillets. So these uh, small stillets, they will again mix with the uh, wet uh, uh, grain solubles. So these uh, small stillets will have more of fat. So now whatever the variations we get in the fat content, especially what we observe in India, is mainly because of this uh, small stillets where the mixing is in improper. So batch to batch variation is there. And this is just to show the nutrient composition of the DDS. These figures are from uh, Evonik 2018, uh, it's almost 258 average of Indian 258 samples each. So the, 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 the maize uh, crude protein is around 30% and the amino acids are not bad. Whereas a broken rice, uh, it is a good source of protein with around 40, 45% on an average is 42 with a fat content of 5% and a uh, reasonably good composition of the amino acids. So based on my experience as of today in India, uh, the recommendations like we can go up to three to 5% in broilers, especially of rice DDGS, uh, layers around five to 10% and dairy animals 10 to 20%. And we can, with rice DDGS, we can take a ME of somewhere around 2,700 to 2,900. And uh, the, as far as the digestibility is concerned, uh, we can say uh, different amino acids at different levels on an average around 5 to 10 percent less digest digestible than this way I've been made. So with this introduction, I would now allow, uh, like, allow to uh, hear from uh, all the speakers. Let us uh, eagerly wait for the speakers to express their opinion on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your uh... Very nice overview, introducing the DDGS and how uh, the use is coming up in India. Uh, we will come back to you with more questions as we go along. Uh, now I would request our second presentation, uh, which is from Dr. A. Natrajan uh, from the Veterinary College and Research Institute, Tanuvas Namakkal. Dr. Natrajan is a very, very accomplished uh, scientist with several awards and uh, it was very nice of him to have agreed. He is a little unwell, but still he said that he will keep his promise. And he has been really working on the quality considerations of DDGS for the last two years. We are really thankful to you for agreeing to share your experience, sir. Over to you, sir. Oh, thank you, madam. <clears throat> Most sincere uh, apologies for my inability to talk uh, uh, due to my sore throat yesterday. And <laughs> my vocal cards are little uncooperative. 
However, I can uh, um, assure you that I can manage. And today's topic uh, is a very interesting one. That is the use of uh, DTGS. What are the quality considerations <clears throat> on the animal feeding uh, in, in case of the production as well as the health of the livestock and poultry? Uh, are you able to see the sl slides? Hello? Yes, sir, we can see. Please go ahead. Yeah, the slides are not moving here. Oh. Anyway. Can you... Uh, I will uh, stop share. And restart. And then do it again. You do it again, please. I'm sorry for that. So what is uh, DDGS? As Dr. Patabrahma told very clearly, I would like to expand it. It's a co-product of dry grind ethanol uh, that is being done in this country in a majority scale and from grinds as feedstock. Then only we'll get to the DDGS and obtained by combining the final two remaining producers, that is distillers, dried grains and the solubles. Sometimes the solubles are also called syrup in India apart from being named as stillage. So it usually contains unhydrolyzed, unfermented grain components, such as the hulls of the seed, germ, protein, and more importantly, the oil. Uh, already Dr. Patabrahma has very clearly told that this is the schematic uh, ethanol production. The final two uh, co-products, that is the DDG, it is rightly called DDG. When DDG is combined with the solubles, then it becomes DDGS. It is supposed to be mixed and sold as DDGS. Or if DDGS alone is sold, as is being done in rice DDGS markets in India, it cannot be called as DDGS. Ethanol is mostly produced from sugarcane, molasses, apart from use of broken rice and also the edible rice from FCA from time to time. Maize is also used in a small quantity to produce ethanol. You can see the ethanol pricing and the efficiency of ethanol from each of the class of the feedstock. However, sugarcane and molasses are in majority from where ethanol is being produced, but government is encouraging to use uh, grains also, and also as a plan to increase the ethanol production from the current 330 crore liters, which is about 8.5% uh, of blending on an average last year, is planning to increase to 1,013 crores of uh, the ethanol to reach a blending efficiency of 20%. The demand may go even further because ethanol 100 two wheelers are being manufactured in the country in huge numbers and are being sold. So, the choice of feedstock for ethanol production sugarcane needs more water, but maize is the highest demand for animal. That is why maize is not used for uh, uh, ethanol production in India as is being done in Brazil and US in a large scale. Also, the B type of molasses and C type of molasses are being consistently used for ethanol production, but elsewhere molasses is diverted for other purposes for other alcohol production. So the option that is left is the waste rice that are in huge quantities um, available in India across the country, and also the FCA rice in, ex in excess are the most available feedstock for additional ethanol production. Other cereals may also be used, like uh, sorghum, wheat, bajra, and other millets, or even a mixed way, but it is all area specific and in small quantities. So, under the situations explained thus far, in the years to come, the supply of rice based DDGS and small quantity of corn based DDGS are expected to increase. Eventually, as told by Dr. Patabrahma, the feed industry 
may also face variations in their quality due to main reasons. I'm going to focus the use of DDGS in animal feeding, taking into consideration the primary uh, livestock and poultry that is broilers, layers, and dairy one after another. I would like to take up broilers first. What is the level of uh, corn DDGS in broilers worldwide? A lot of uh, literature are available on broilers uh, with, with respect to only the corn DDGS. However, these are very helpful to us. Uh, this particular slide tells us that uh, DDGS has been used at 12% in the starter and 18% uh, in the finisher. You can see the body weight uh, from the control is low as far as the DDGS is concerned. But when enzymes are added, it improves upon the body weight. And even the properties have helped in bringing up the body weight to a certain level. Feed intake is also very variable in DDGS uh, uh, added um, uh, treatment. You can see drop in feed intake. And FCR almost uh, uh, in the DDS usage is almost equal to control, whereas it improves when enzymes and probiotics are used. But the main thing, that is very interesting is when it is being used in broilers, the processing plant, the breast analysis says that linoleic acid is very high. As, as we have checked in our laboratory using the GC, that the fatty acid profile of DDG samples shows the content of linoleic acid is very high in the fat content of the breast, which means that omega-3 fatty acids will be very high and uh, uh, any farm, any uh, entrepreneur who is producing, uh, processing chicken can claim that the fatty acid profile will be having more of linoleic acid, which will eventually end up in more of <clears throat> omega-3 fatty acids. And one more uh, broiler trial using a conventional um, variety of DDGS, which has only just 27% protein with about uh, ether extract of uh, 7.9, I mean 9.6, and 7.9 fiber against high protein DDGS from the same corn stock, having 34% of protein with about uh, ether extract of 7.9 and 8.4% fiber. But amino acids are not adjusted. Because of that, uh, the DDGS uh, is deficient in lysine. It shows high protein added DDGS groups are having lesser lysine and has resulted in lower body weight gain when compared to the conventional, which is having um, more of fat in it, as well as lysine also in the control. Methionine is almost same in all the groups. Orginase is also deficient. So from this slide, we can understand that if high protein DDGS uh, is added at higher level, about 10%, one has to be very cautious about uh, lysine content as well as the orginine content. We will own the methionine and threonine, which is almost seen as equal to in every treatment group. Then in, this, in a, another trial where uh, corn DDGS has been attempted in broiler in COP 500, it has been used up to 50%. And you can see up to 10% level, the body weight is comparable with uh, control, whereas beyond 10%, the body weight goes down and it is very serious at 50% level, almost some 700 grams gone down. And feed intake, you can see it goes down beyond 20% inclusion. And FCR is uh, almost very uh, high when the inclusion goes beyond 10%. When it comes to dressing percentage, up to 10% is okay. But beyond that, a serious uh, drop in dressing percentage happens. And uh, breast percentage to the live weight gain is also reducing, even at a level, at about 10% level. And the problem with uh, pellet or crumble manufacturing with addition of DDGS from corn, because the bulk density is very low, the particles or the crumbles become very lighter and it can be appreciated in the bulk density data here. So dressing percentage and the breast image yield appear to be very sensitive to the inclusion of DDGS. So those who are in, involved in processing of chicken, 
who might be uh, should be aware of uh, these uh, happenings I experienced in from the earlier works. And the serious findings are body weight reduces as the level increases beyond 10. Feed intake also reduces. FCR also increases. Dressing percentage reduces. Breast yield also goes down. And more than 30% inclusion, the, the bulk density significantly goes down. And gut fill happens with the lesser energy in the feed and birds will not be able to perform as expected. With respect to the ME value, that is very critical. We don't have much uh, trials in India to know about the metabolizable energy value of the poultry. From the quantities we have um, global data, you can appreciate that conventional maize DDGS, which is about 26% uh, protein, and mind fat is always about 9%, that is 10. Fiber is about 7%. This is the conventional uh, maize DDGS pattern, uh, nutrient content. You can see the maize, the metabolizable energy content varies between 2,800 to 2,863. Whereas in the modern maize DDGS, where the protein content is high, fruit, fruit fat is almost uh, half to 5% and crude fiber is also less, you can see there is a serious reduction in the ME value by about 300 kilocalories, which is about only 2,500 kilocalories per kg of uh, modern maize DDGS. What could be the uh, amino acid digestibility uh, from the experience of using it uh, from the origin of corn? Uh, you know, uh, the DDGS are always reflective of the grains that are used. So here, corn, it is very deficient in lysine and due to high temperature applied uh, in the process of ethanol production, which goes up to 400 degree Fahrenheit, some quantity of mylar reaction happens, which immediately affects the lysine content in the digestibility. So you can appreciate, you can see the DDGS, which has just only 1 to 1.5% lysine, the digestibility is only 65% as against the soybean meal, which has some 89% uh, digestibility, but has more than 3% lysine in it. So always it is advantageous that soybean meal is having high lysine content, which is very important. And the first limiting acid in broiler, which is very critical. And so in uh, adding DGGS um, beyond certain level, one has to be wary of these things. And uh, it's very important that high oil DTG can also be a very useful in meeting out the energy uh, as well as the amino acid digestibility. So higher level of, uh, uh, again, this slide says higher inclusion levels cause body weight gain slightly up to 10% level, but carcass, carcass yield decreases and FCR increases. <clears throat> then what, what could be the effect of uh, such DDGS feeding on gut health? Only few works are available globally. Uh, I, I have collected two works, which has challenged uh, against coccidiosis. Uh, which is a uh, uh, very economical, important disease. You can see up to 20%, it did not uh, um, gains the control with the challenge with coccidiosis, did not reduce or increase the coccidiosis level. So the ultimately, they have come to a conclusion that DTJ has no role in increasing or reducing the coccidiosis. But the other work, which has used up to 10% level inclusion in broiler, which is challenged against this clostridium perfusions, they have found some shift in the ileal content microbiota where you can see, they could see the clostridium perfusions count uh, reduced uh, and mortality and lesion scores were similar in both control as well as the challenged one with the DTGS usage. Coming to the Indian scenario of using uh, <clears throat> the most available rice DDGS. We have one or two works that has been carried out uh, by the ICR Institute from CARI, but not this uh, COP500 or anything. It is the CARI's CARI Vishal. You can see they have used up to 15% and they are comfortable with 12.5%, having very similar body weight gain and a little uh, uh, similar feed intake and similar FCR. 
and they have found uh, uh, similar digestibility and also this breast yield, which are very different uh, from other works using the corn DDGs. They have concluded that uh, the level up to 12.5% can be used in this particular uh, breed. And beyond that, 15% uh, level causes serious reduction in body weight gain, um, uh, reduction in feed intake, and increase in the FCR. Uh, eventually, uh, the reason could be the reduction in the digestibility, and even the breast yield also have gone down. Coming to the layers, <laughs> the modern layers, um, a level using the maize DGS with 27% crude protein, 10% oil, and fiber of 9%. So always should keep in, in mind that uh, maize origin will have uh, this particular nutrient uh, matrix, 27% of crude protein, 10% of oil, and a fiber content of 9%. If the stillage or the solubles or the syrup are mixed with the DDG, and the level that has been used in the modern layers has been up to 20%. And you can see uh, up to 5% level or even up to 10% level, the 8 percentage has been found to be very good and good respectively. Egg numbers also the same result and egg mass also the same result. But when it exceeds 10% and beyond 15%, all the parameters, percentage, egg numbers, and egg mass have come down significantly and hence is not recommended beyond 15% as per this work using the maize origin DDGS. And the work of uh, another using the rice DDGS, 47% crude protein, 2% oil, and fiber of 3%. Again, it is very different from uh, uh, maize origin. The protein is almost uh, uh, higher by 20%. Oil is reduced by about 8% and fiber also goes down. So seriously in uh, rice DDGs, we cannot find uh, more of oil and fiber. So it's more of protein and the use of uh, that in modern layers. In this particular uh, trial, you can see used up to 10%. They have found almost increase, very good increase, significant increase in the egg percentage. Uh, apart from weight gain of about 100 grams, 120 grams additionally, and also increase in the egg mass. So higher methionine, water-soluble vitamins that are available in the rice DDGs, biologically active substances, and uh, prebiotic contents like uh, mannan oligosaccharides that claim to be the reasons for the improvement. And when enzymes are added, further in increase in the egg percentage and uh, equal weight gain and egg mass are found generally when the enzymes are added up. And in a very typical uh, usage of this rice DDGS of about 46% uh, protein uh, from about 20 weeks in the BV300 uh, breed, isocaloric and amino acid equated, but not the protein. The egg percentage has been found to be increasing uh, at about 8% uh, level. Uh, even up to 12% level, same egg percentage is maintained in the similar feed intake, feed per egg, in fact, reduced. Egg weight is also uh, maintained up to 8% level. Beyond that, egg production goes down. And you can see, appreciate, uh, from my personal communication with Dr. S. V. Ramarao, he has found very seriously, beyond 12%, uh, uh, he started observing some feather uh, loss. And you can see very serious uh, effect of feather loss. When 16% of that particular lot of uh, rice-based DDGs has been used. Whereas in my own experience, I have included up to 10% level in modern layers. I couldn't find any such uh, losses. It's very interesting. And the reason could be some change in the amino acid pattern or serious loss of uh, the minerals could be the reason for such losses in the other pattern used by Dr. Sri Rama. Then in the case of uh, dairy cattle, an excellent review worldwide on corn DDGs usage in dairy is summarized here with the content of protein of about 30% and rumen undeliverable protein in about 16% of that 30%, which is 
50% of the total protein. And the energy content for lactation is 2,250 kilocalories per kg of dry matter, fruit fat of 9 to 10%, and readily digestible fiber, which is important for uh, dairy animals, that is called NDF, is about 39%. The um, usual, the uh, gross observations uh, based on the excellent review done by this order is up to 20% of high protein cakes replacement of by this con DDGS intermittently, intermediate byproducts of food processing industry can be boldly added up to 20% of high protein cakes replacing that. And more importantly, uh, the particular uh, DDGS, which is available uh, in India, has been found to be having very low content of B1. That is an average of uh, 460 samples we analyzed in the last three years. So this favors uh, the usage of DDGS in a huge manner in the years to come in dairy, as the demand for low aflatoxin M1 will be on demand for domestic use as well as the export. Digestibility is always on the higher side when DDGS are used in ruminant diet. The syrup, which is the second co-product, the final co-product, is safely used and also be a very good source to feed the dairy animals. Uh, but the uh, regulatory regulation does not allow the uh, syrup to be moved out of the uh, plants. So zero wastage, uh, 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 zero, zero conversion, zero transport from the plant. So syrup has to be mixed with the DDG to be sold as DDGS. And this particular use of uh, DDGS, buffaloes have been shown normal production when even 25% of the dry matter was replaced safely with the DDGS. And one of these studies uh, has also used the DDGS up to 30% level. You can see the milk uh, in liters per day per animal has increased by about four liters in the Holstein Frisian uh, species. And when it is corrected to 4%, then you can see uh, about 1.6% of uh, uh, six uh, liters of milk has increased when 30% of the dry matter has been replaced with DDGS. Very interestingly, DDGS has been found to decrease the methane produced by the ruminants. That could be one very interesting uh, research area for reducing the methane, which the worldwide is more concerned about. My own, my own uh, personal experience on dairy of using two different types of rice DDGS obtained from uh, a plant in West Bengal, where we have used uh, two different types of DDGS. One is a full protein of 30, having fat of 6 to 7%, and fiber 8%. And the other one is 45% protein, less than 3% fat, and fiber is also reduced by 4%. You can see, appreciate, the protein is increased at the cost of fat and fiber. In the second uh, DDGS, where protein is very high, fat is very low, and fiber is very low, the milk yield either did not increase or to some extent it got reduced. And in addition to reluctance in feed intake by the animals were noticed uh, in a farm where we have more than 250 gir and sahiwal animals. Whereas if the usage of DDGS is of uh, 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 the quality of 30% protein, having fat of six to seven, fiber of 8%, the milk yield increased by 4%. And milk fat also increased by 4.4 to 0.5%. And another experience uh, from Sikkim, where it has been nearly an organic state in agriculture, use of this uh, rice based DDGS at 5% level was found to be encouraging in terms of milk yield, milk fat, and even the SNF. And I would, I would like to share some of the interesting findings from our, our laboratory, Animal Feed and Technical Quality Assurance Laboratory on some of the uh, principles of proximate calcium phosphorus of the rice DDGS collected from April 2019 to July 2022, you can see the only problem we are facing is uh, the moisture content has always been found to be uh, very high little, uh, like uh, an average 16%, the maximum reaching 22 in rice DDGS, crude protein 45, fiber is very low, Ether extract is also very low. But very interestingly, the phosphorus content has been found to be very high, not like other plant products, which has only 0.15%, whereas here the phosphorus is 0.68. And even the available phosphorus is also very high. And compared to the corn DDGS, 
uh, we have received in our laboratory, uh, which shows only 28.5% protein, uh, but the fiber content is nine. And interestingly, the ether content is 7.36%. On average, the rice DTGS and corn DTGS is having less than 10 PPP level of aflatoxin B1, which is very encouraging uh, to go for daily animal feeding in order to have a milk of high quality, very less aflatoxin M1. So to conclude my presentation on the use of DTGS um, on production health and processing issues in broilers, not more than 5% in pre-starter and 7.5 to 10% in grower and finisher diets with lysine supplementation. Layers, not more than 5% in phase one in the, in the weeks of 20 to 40, and not more than 10% in phase two, that is 41 to 72 weeks. And in dairy, we can safely use replacing the 25% of the dry matter boldly with the DDGs of the conventional quality to have better milk yield, milk fat, and uh, SNF also. Keep in mind, this is my last slide. Always keep in mind that, as said by Dr. Uh, <coughs> Nanta's nutritionist, there is considerable variation in quality of DDGs, whether any of the type of grains are used due to various reasons. So it is strongly recommended that DDGs from a specific plant, if it is very suitable for your own production, even if you are able to find 12.5 or 15% replacement is comfortable in terms of uh, body weight, FCR and everything, kindly maintain the consistency once obtained by buying from the same plant and the same quality. Amino acid level, digestibility of uh, the dry matter content, phosphorus content, oil content and energy, color of the DDGS and the crude fiber content are the important quality determinants in every class of livestock and poultry. Since there are chances of poor quality grains that could be being used in the plants, myto mycotoxin contents become very critical parameter in broiler at least. So one has to be very careful about use of DDGS when they are very particular about uh, the FCR, even uh, sub decimal level is very important. So one has to be very careful about the aflatoxin B1 by testing every lot of DTGs they buy. And high content of total phosphorus and available phosphorus are advantages in reducing the cost of the feed formation and also uh, environmental pollution, which will be the very high uh, stake in the years to come. Corn DTGs as high xanthophils, which are very advantages in importing the desirable color of birds from skin to every part of the uh, edible portions. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for the patient hearing. Thank you so much, sir. And I was observing in that some of the questions, you know, asked after Dr. Patabi's presentation were actually, you know, explained in your presentation. So we'll get back to you with the more questions and move on in the program as of now. Thank you once again, sir. Uh, in our program, we have uh, we had thought that we will have uh, some of the industry representatives actually talk about their uh, perspective or their experience on how they have used this. And I would uh, now request Mr. Sanjay Patel. He is from uh, Sabar Diary in Himat Nagar, Gujarat. If you would like to speak for uh, two to three minutes, sir. Mr. Patel. Mr. Patel, can you unmute yourself? Oh, okay, ma'am. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Actually, we have used this DTGS before two, three years, but uh, regular availability and quant uh, quality of that matter, uh, quality matters for that. Pro proper availability is not there. And pro hello. 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 Yes, we can hear you. Please continue. Ma'am, my net has gone. Hello. Yes, but Hello. we can hear you. Ah. Oh, uski availability nahi hai, ma'am. Proper or uski stop. Matlab, he is giving a false order also. And aflatoxin issue is more there. Hello. 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 
Yes, yes. Uh, we can hear you, sir. We can hear you, Mr. Patel. You want to say something else? I think there are some uh, net issues with him. I will now request to Dr. Geeta. Uh, from she is the assistant general manager in Sugna Foods. To, to Mr. Patel, you can unmute yourself. <coughs> Dr. Geeta, would you like to share your experience in using DDGS to... Yes. Uh, good, afternoon, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So we have, uh, uh, we have used this uh, DDGS. Uh, uh, we are using uh, in uh, poultry feed for the last uh, four years. We are using it uh, continuously. So initially we tried the corn DDGS, then rice DDGS and uh, mixed uh, uh, DDGS. So uh, with the corn DDGS, uh, we were facing issues of aflatoxin. So, so we stopped using corn DDGS, but whenever uh, the aflatoxin limit is uh, within the permissible level, so uh, we can use it. Then other thing is uh, with the mixed DDGS, uh, uh, there is variation in the uh, nutritive value, so we could uh, we could not get a consistent uh, nutritive value with the mixed DDGs. So uh, we stopped using the mixed DDGs. This uh, rice DDGs we are using uh, continuously uh, because uh, the nutritive value uh, is also consistent and the uh, quality, like the aflatoxin is also within the uh, limit. Uh, uh, many times uh, we receive the rice DDGs with nil toxin. At least sometimes we get uh, maybe five PPV or 10 PPV, or it is always less than 20 PPV. So continuously we are facing the uh, rice DDGs, three to 5% of inclusion in the poultry feed. Uh, then another thing is, uh, the only uh, challenge sometimes we are observing is the high moisture, uh, uh, high moisture percentage in the DDGs, like up to 16%. Or uh, even with, uh, with some supply, we are getting even up to 17% uh, 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 moisture. So if moisture is well between uh, uh, or less than 12%, so it is ideal to use uh, uh, in the uh, poultry feed. Then uh, another thing is, so uh, uh, some of the consignments we received uh, the, a different color or dark brown or a little bit blackish in color, uh, the DDGS. So that is because of the overheating. So whenever they dry, so they uh, they dry over dry so that the material is getting charred. So these kind of uh, material we are avoiding. So only only the DDGs that is dried at the proper temperature and at proper time. So those items we are using. Then one more concern we had is the uh, presence of uh, this uh, nitrogen or non-protein nitrogen or the presence of ammonia. So that we detected in few of the samples. But when we discussed it with the uh, when we discussed it with the manufacturers or the suppliers, we understood that uh, nitrogen is provided as the source of uh, food for the yeast that is involved in the process of fermentation. So because of uh, this, uh, we can expect uh, traces of uh, nitrogen in, in DDGs. So normally in poultry feed, we don't allow uh, non-protein nitrogen beyond a certain limit. So when this was the concerning factor, we discussed with the suppliers and uh, and it is uh, understood that it is uh, used as a source of food for the yeast involved in fermentation process. So there is uh, there will be no negative effect because of this. So these points we understood uh, from the suppliers and uh, by using the DDGs we could uh, reduce our feed cost uh, to a major extent at least of. Uh, 500 rupees, 500 rupees to 800 rupees per ton, uh, we are saving by using uh, this DDG. So it is helping us to reduce the feed cost. So this is my experience uh, with use of DDG. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Geeta. Thank you for uh, sharing your experience. And I am sorry for have contacted you with a short notice, but uh, thank you for okay. participating. Uh, so we heard from Dr. Natarajan a very detailed presentation on the use of DDGS. And as Sir started his presentation, he said that 
US has been leading, you know, leading producer, US and Brazil actually are using a lot of grain feedstock for ethanol production. And because of that, they are also the largest producers of DDGS. And um, it is not only being used internally in these countries, but exported to several countries. And I understand uh, that more than 55 countries or so it is being exported to. So there is a much wider international experience as compared to our experience of using this uh, for you know poultry, dairy, or aqua feeds. So it is keeping in this background, we have um, two international consultants, Dr. Budi Tandeyaya and Dr. Rani Tan, who would be sharing the international perspective on use of DDGS in the livestock uh, sector as a for the feeding livestock. Uh, so I will uh, give it over to Dr. Pudi first, uh, who will be talking about the practical experience in using corn DDGS for feeding livestock in Southeast Asia. So uh, as uh, Dr. Natarajan already said that in all these countries, it is the corn which is used for the DDGS production. They don't use rice. So we have here the experience sharing uh, by Dr. Pudi uh, on the corn DDGS for feeding livestock in other countries. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahuya. Are you able to hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you and we can see your slides also. Okay, good, good. Uh, I'm going to share the experience when we promoting DDGS in Southeast Asia, especially the corn DDGS, they are imported from, um, uh, from US for feeding different livestock species in, in Southeast Asia. If, if you look at the number, how much the import that we receive uh, DDGS to Southeast Asia, currently more than 3 million ton of US DDGS is imported in Southeast Asia. If you look at the breakdown by the country since the last, for example, six years, Vietnam is number one, which importing more than 1.3 million ton, and then followed by Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines, and then Malaysia. Uh, I like to mention here that uh, if you look at the usage of DDG in different country can be different species. In Vietnam, mostly DDGS is used in swine, in the pig feeding, but starting also to feed it to poultry, especially uh, for broiler and ducks also. And some people start to use it also for aqua. Different thing in Indonesia. Indonesia uh, majority will be used mostly for poultry, with small amount of uh, swine, a small amount of also with aqua. In terms of the poultry that both broiler and layer has been fed with DDGS in Indonesia. In Thailand, similarly, DDGS is mainly uh, fed with uh, for, for poultry, which is broiler and layer and swine. The Philippines, probably combination between uh, swine and poultry. So, but there are some certain cases that uh, dairy cattle also has been fed with DDGS. I'm going to explain a little bit later. So what did corn DDGS? We, we look at the nutrient content of the US corn DDGS mainly containing the energy, protein, and available phosphorus, very high level. And there's no anti-nutritive factor as it is coming from corn. Currently, the supply of US DDGS become more consistent and we can look at the data in the last probably five years, the quality become more, more consistent, uh, DDGS coming from US. And the price, again, uh, industry is very sensitive with the price. With the current price of deliver, for example, $400 of DDGS uh, to Southeast Asia, many people is still possible to use DDGS. However, uh, we have to remember that uh, because this is derived from corn, we receive high amount of the santofil. The santofil content in DDGS is approximately around 40 to 50 ppm, which is uh, almost three times compared to the original corn. So this is kind of the beneficial for feeding layer, especially to get the richer color of egg yolk. However, you have to remember also in DDGS, there is high amount of yeast. The regular DDGS coming to Southeast Asia is a reported approximately about 4% containing yeast. However, with the high protein, with the new development of DDG in the US, they are producing high protein DDGS starting from 40%, then 
there are also many 50%. There's a lot of yeast component inside of DDG and yeast can be valuable for certain animals. So this is what recommended of the, the uh, composition of DDGS coming uh, from US. You can get all the information on DDGS coming from handbook. The handbook is published by US Green Council. You can go to the website and you can download the handbook, very probably 200 pages of the handbook. You can include all the information on DDGS for feeding virus livestock. This is a typical, we cannot use the NRC book anymore to look at the nutrient content of DDG. Uh, if you look at the DDG here from corn, I put it in the bracket, is the fat content different and energy different? So originally DDGS in the US is produced without separation of the fat. So the fat will be very high, close to 10%. But lately, because the technology has been developed, some of the fat insoluble of the DDGS will be removed and sell separately as a biodiesel. So there's reason why lately many DDGS coming from US has a lower fat content compared to 10 years ago. In that case, probably the energy will be lower because the fat content is lower. However, there's tendency that the protein content slightly higher because uh, guess, uh, the proportion of the fat is lower. So this is the typical of the, uh, the data because a lot of research has been conducted in the US. A lot of university uh, has been explored DDGS for feeding various animal. There's more information of DDG coming from corn in the US compared to the other country. So even poultry and also in pig and aqua, the three most expensive nutrient uh, in using of, uh, the, uh, of the nutrient, First one is the energy, it's the most expensive one, especially when the price of corn or wheat is going up. And secondly, we have to talk about amino acid. Some people talk about the protein, but we consider the amino acid. The third most expensive with phosphorus. I mentioned to you that the DDGS from US containing a reasonable amount of the energy, amino acid or protein and available phosphorus. Look at the position of DDGS among uh, other ingredient ingredients in terms of the energy value, and also in the protein level. So if corn contain high in energy, but lower in the protein, on this, the other side, soybean meal, soya contain high in protein, but lower in energy. DDG is somewhere between corn and soybean meal. So if you want to value of DDGS, you can consider the value between corn and soybean meal in between. However, value for pig, seem that pig will be able to extract more energy uh, from DDGS, there's reason, applicably for pig in some area will be much better because ability of the pig to extract more energy. So in that case, how do you people the value, the, all the feed mill uh, in Southeast Asia value DDG, you have to compare it, put it in the feed formulation, input the correct nutrient database and let the computer decide whether it's applicable or not. So this, for example, if the corn price is $305, and so bean meal price is $550. DDGS price supposed to be in between, so $427. But some people said, oh, because the energy is lower, supposed to be equivalent with 60% of the corn and 40% of soybean meal, so $100. Current DDGS price in, in coming to Southeast Asia is $390. So DDGS make attractive feed ingredient. So better value for energy and the protein, which is two the most expensive nutrient. However, if you want to use the DGS, my experience, you have to know what the nutrient content because the DGS can be varied between one plant and other because the DGS is product of fermentation and the quality may vary. However, the good news that the DGS coming from US nowadays become more consistent. We can show the, the, the data later on. Uh, another trial that the DGS for before we moving to dairy, I like to recommend that the DDGS uses in Southeast Asia, we included around 5% in the broiler starter, increasing in the 10% in grower and up to 15% in the finisher. Why we don't want to use it more than 15%, the pellet quality we may go down because using high amount of DDGS. So the binding of DDGS is less for pellet and feed intake will be lower. So normally we recommend up to maximum 15% for the broiler finisher, However, for the starter will be 5%. On layer, we got experience. So many farmers has been using 15%. In fact, more than that one, up to 20% of corn DDGS coming from the US. 
So there are some study, in fact, in Iowa State University, you can fit it DDGS in higher level, what the result is that they are able to maintain uh, egg production, but in reality, the ammonia level in the barn, the ammonia production is less. Seem that DDGS uh, 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 try to limit the ammonia production in the barn, not only for the layer, but also the detected in swine operation. So this is the data that we, I conducted the trial in Indonesia. How do you replace DDGS with the, for concentrate? So we put it the uh, milk production and then try to monitor and uh, to replace the dairy concentrate one kilo and replace it with DDGS one kilo. If you look at the milk production by replacing DDG, the production will be going up in the last three months. So this is issue on mycotoxin is everywhere. DDGS, uh, is coming from corn. So if the corn contaminated with mycotoxin, of course, DDGS will be higher in mycotoxin. However, if you look at the data of DDGS coming from US, from many different ethanol plant, DDGS level, aflatoxin level has been very, very low from the US. Similarly with DON, or T2 toxin is relatively, relatively low. What's the reason why uh, DDGS coming from US is low? This is because uh, the corn produced in US harvest it in the dry condition. There's only 15.5 or 16% moisture content in corn. So if you look at the analysis of aflatoxin in US corn is very, very low. 95%, 98% is below 5 ppb in US corn. So the resulting of DDGS from the US will be very low in uh, mycotoxin in general. Uh, the U.S. ethanol also continue to produce DGS in better quality. This is the data reported by Dr. Hanstein from University of Illinois. If you look at in the last probably uh, 15 years, uh, the DGS quality is changing. The lysine containing, uh, content containing in the DGS is going up and also the digestibility getting better. So it seems that because the experience of the modern ethanol plant in the U.S. keep improving in the last 20 years, they are able to produce the product which is more consistent and higher quality. In addition, also the new technology coming try to produce high protein DDGS up to 50%, not only 40%, but up to 50% and containing a lot of yeast. So this is the situation of DDGS. That's the reason why DDGS become very popular in, uh, in Southeast Asia. However, what we recommend for the iron client, the end user in using DDGS, you have to consider, of course, the cost. The cost is not only the price, because the price will be affected by the supply and demand. As nutritionists, you have to look at the what nutrient level inside of DDGS. Look at the variation and consistency. Look at the bioavailability, especially digestibility. Uh, also contamination, of course. But, uh, but in general, the US DDG is containing less aflatoxin compared to the other supplier. However, we have to consider what the handling Many people are complaining about the handling of DDGS, whether it's possible. Nowadays, DDGS with less oil normally able to flow quite well. But at the end of the day, animal will tell you whether DDGS is performing well or not. So DDGS has been used mainly in poultry and swine in Southeast Asia, including the aqua, especially fish. But some company, especially the dairy and beef cattle, also starting to use DDGS successfully up to the 10 or 20% in the diet. So again, a price and nutrition is related. How do you evaluate that one? I recommend to use feed formulation software to evaluate whether the DDGS is possible for feeding livestock or not. So in my conclusion, the US DDGS is coming from modern plant in the last 20 years experience and quality is continue to improve. The quality uh, has been proven in many research and exported to many country in Asia including Southeast Asia will be more than 3.5 million ton and fed it to poultry, swine, and aqua. Quality of the US DDGS is higher than rice. If you look at the data, especially in the digestibility, percentage of digestibility, uh, the protein content in rice DDGS is higher than the corn US DDGS, but the digestibility is higher in terms of percentage. The value should be compared, of course, uh, DDGS comparing with corn and uh, soybean meal and also oil because the energy is expensive and uh, computer feed formulation is recommended. It has been successfully for feeding broiler layer swine, aqua, beef and dairy in Southeast Asia. 
So this is my experience in the sharing of the DDGS uses in Southeast Asia in the last 15 years. With that, I'm going to return back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gudi, for sharing experience so nicely. Uh, we'll come back to you. There are some questions in the chat box if you can answer them. And we'll come back to you during the discussion. Uh, continuing with this international perspective, I would now invite Dr. Ronnie Tan, who is the regional aquaculture consult consultant, to talk about opportunities for DDGS in aquaculture. Over to you, sir. Thanks very much, Dr. Huja. I'd like to start by showing, oh, okay, again, it is stuck, so I'm going to redo this again. Right. The first thing I want to do is to show all of you how important India is as a global shrimp producer. But when the lockdown came in 2020, the farmers were receiving very poor prices X farm. And what happened here was that some farmers decided that they would stay away from farming for one or two cycles. And then in 2020, there was a reduction of production of shrimp out of India by 16%. In 2021, this rebounded and India managed to produce 900,000 tons of shrimp. I'd like to compare this with Ecuador. If you have a look at Ecuador, the same thing happened. The X farm prices for shrimp were very low when Ecuador went into lockdown, but the farmers just carried on. No one stopped farming. And in 2020, Ecuador ended with a 27% increase in shrimp production. When the rebound came in 2021, it crossed a million tons, the first time for any country. But the important figure I want all of you to remember is that the total production in 2021 globally was very close to 5 million metric tons. And in this year, 2022, we expect this to hit about 5.5 million tons. Why is this important? Let me come to my next slide. If you look at shrimp demand and supply for the coming year, 2023, we see supply increasing from the last slide but demand has been hampered by inflation and rising prices. If you look at just a composite of frozen seafood in the US, in September this year, prices went up by 15% compared to last year, same period last year. Shrimp is a very price elastic um, food. When prices go up, consumption drops and vice versa. It also happens in the EU, but there is a lag time in the EU. The other country, which is the third largest importer of shrimp in the world is China. And with China's zero COVID policy today, it is hampering demand and demand is very low. Let me give you an anecdote to just give you a very good example. Chinese New Year is the highest peak period for consumption and Chinese New Year next year is in January, which means that in September, October, China should already be importing and buying shrimp. But this year they were not. So I contacted some of my old buyers and asked them why, what is happening? And all of them have told me the same story. They're holding two to three months stock inventory right now but all it needs is another lockdown by the Beijing government and this stock will become six months. This will deteriorate their cash flow situation. So they're not very willing to import more. So while you see prices increasing in the consumer markets, X farm prices are falling because of this increased production. So why is there this mismatch? and where are the costs increasing along the supply chain? If you look at the supply chain I'm showing you in the um, slide, I'll talk about feed in the next slide, but 
I also want to mention that there is a huge um, increase in container cost. Pre-pandemic, I used to export shrimp to the US and one refrigerated container would cost me about 2,500 US dollars. In the first quarter of 2021, this went up to 13,000 US dollars per container. It has since come down to about 6,000, but you can see where this increase in cost is coming from. The next is port congestion. Los Angeles port is the major port for entry for shrimp coming in from Asia, as well as from Ecuador. And it has been really congested. So this, together with supply chain disruptions, has led to low market inventory in the US. And I've mentioned inflation earlier on, this has increased cost. But the major concern for us as a producer is really aquafeed cost. We have seen ingredient prices go skyrocketing, soy, corn, and with the invasion of uh, Ukraine, wheat prices have gone up as well. So feed companies have no choice but to increase the feed prices by at least 15 to 20%. An average shrimp grow feed with 36% crude protein today cost $1.15 per kilogram. The cost of production of a size 60 shrimp, which is 18 grams, is now US $3.50. Farmers are feeding squeeze. There are no margins to be made anymore. And a lot of farmers are complaining today. So the question we have is that how can India's aquafeed segment support the supply chain? And this is where I want to introduce corn DDGS as a value for money feed ingredient. Let's look at prices first. The blue line shows you the price of soybean meal, FOB. The green line shows you the price of DDGS, FOB as well. So we're comparing direct uh, cost here. The red line is the difference between the two. So as the red line goes up, it shows you that corn DDGS is an excellent alternative and value for protein ingredient. This is good for the feed miller, but what about the farmer? Can we use corn DDGS in shrimp feed? And this is what we wanted to find out. And a trial was carried out, and this is a lab trial, and it was done by Novi Novriadi, Romi Novriadi, who is a senior researcher with the ministry in Indonesia. It was also done with Erwin Suwendi, who is the chief nutritionist for Jabfa Comfeed, which is the second largest shrimp feed producer in Indonesia. This has been um, published, so it is peer reviewed, and the, the trial is a credible, uh, it has credible results. Let me just sort of share with you a summary of these results. A lot of trials conducted on shrimp start with one gram and they finish at five grams. This is easy to do. But farmers complain. They say that I grow my shrimp up to 19 grams. So what happens during the later stage? So this is where our methodology had to change. We had to do a two-stage trial with the same feed in order to ensure that we mimic a commercial operation right up to 19 grams. The two stages were done, the first stage was done in the Batam Research Center, which is part of the ministry. And the second stage was done in Chapfa's private research center in Indonesia. And here are the results. So in stage one, which we grew the shrimp from one gram to 10 grams, we used uh, four feeds. V1 was the control feed, which had zero DDGS in it. And then from V2, V3, and V4, we increase the DDGS content from 5% right up to 15%. And the substitution done was for soybean meal as well as wheat. And if you look at the final weight, the survival, the weight gain, and the FCR, there it showed very good results, and there was no significant difference when you compare that with the control. Stage two. This was done uh, with Jabfa Comfeed with exactly the same feed because it was produced by Jabfa. And 
it grew the shrimp from five grams to 19 grams. And again, when you look at the final weight, the survival rates, the weight gain and the FCR, there was no significant difference, which shows that DDGS can be used up to 15% in a shrimp diet. This is well and good, but we needed to have a better advantage than this. And we looked at diet formulation cost. When this trial was carried out and when it started in the middle of 2020, the control feed with zero DDGS cost 8,681 Indonesian rupiah per kilogram of feed. When it was substituted with 15% DDGS, the cost savings in the formulation was close to 2%. We redid this, or we recalculate the formulation again in April 2021. This, by this time, soybean meal had gone up tremendously in cost, corn as well, but wheat not yet. Okay, And with this, the control diet went up to 10,142 Indonesian rupiah, and when we substituted with 15% DDGS, we could easily get 3% cost reductions. So the conclusion here is that we had to do this two-stage approach in order to simulate the commercial cycle of the shrimp culture, and we grew the shrimp up to 19 grams. Survival rates were more than 66%, which is equivalent to a normal commercial cycle, and we had weight gains over 250%. The final body weight, the body weight gain, the FCR, and the survival rates did not differ significantly across all the dietary treatments. It was equivalent to the control diet. So results here indicate that corn DDGS can be used up to 15% as an alternative ingredient in shrimp diets. But more important than that, the diet costs show that shrimp feed prices can be reduced with the use of corn DDGS. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll return the microphone or rather the stage over to Dr. Huja again. Thank you, Dr. Rani. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. And uh, I would again request you to kindly keep answering the questions in the chat box and we'll come back to you in the discussion. So the next uh, presentation actually is from me. Uh, I would like to share with you all, uh, maybe most some participants are aware about us and some are not. Uh, I am from Biotech Consortium India Limited, which is a company which was, a which was an initiative of the Department of Biotechnology Government of India. And uh, for the acceleration of, uh, accelerating the commercialization of biotechnology, we were set up way back in 1990 and have been actually doing quite a bit of work on biosafety and biotechnology aspects of the genetically modified crops, among our other various activities. So since about a year, we have been uh, trying to see, uh, you would all know that last year when there was a shortage of soybean meal, the government permitted the import of GM soybean meal. There have also been a lot of research initiatives and also uh, you know, uh, research initiatives on the development of GM crops, field trials, say, and so on. And uh, just about a week back, a genetically modified mustard has also been uh, approved by the government. BT cotton is uh, the only crop so far. So, um, as was mentioned about the quality issues from the international perspective, uh, the in US, it is the genetically modified corn which is used. So, we thought it would be nice if we can. Uh, uh, share this uh, also with you, uh, what are these GM crops and how they can benefit, adoption can help us uh, uh, benefit, you know. This uh, event has been organized as you all saw with the, uh, with the invitation that, uh, but with the help of the uh, all uh, industry associations in the field and with these industry associations together, we have in the past one year attended uh, several meet, uh, organized several meetings also on GM crops. And it is in these meetings that, that this issue of, you know, DDGS, what is the difference, how we can use, whether we can import, whether uh, how to improve the quality of the local. Sorry, I just stopped it. One minute. Uh, 
uh, all these issues came up and in fact that was the genesis of uh, organizing this uh, uh, webinar also with the with the uh, stakeholders and uh, we had in fact sent specific invitations to the all those people who had uh, attended our uh, uh, events in the last uh, one year or so so i will just uh, very quickly tell you in fact i saw in the chat box uh, some questions that uh, oh what how can we import or what is the difference between the two and what are the, the what are the prices and uh, so on see con uh, this us uh, con based dtgs is not yet available in india uh, and one of the reasons is that it is derived from G, gm crops so as you all heard that the ddgs is a co product of grain based ethanol production and uh, dr natarajan already said us and brazil are the largest producers of fuel ethanol using grain feed stock the corn and is the major uh, you know grain used there and more than 90% of the corn which is grown in both countries is gm corn so <clears throat> uh just very quickly on what are these gm crops they are almost the same as far as the uh, objective of the crop improvement is concerned uh, we in the breeding we do this kind of a transfer in a crossing in the fields whereas in gm crops we try to identify specific genes and then you know uh, try to put them using uh, lab based genetically engineered techniques <clears throat> so uh, the genes are derived from various organisms and some of the examples of gm crops in our day to day life that you could you know uh, all of you are not genetist i know and uh, i will just come back to the very simple information so some of the examples which are already in the market in somewhere in the world are corn which is resistant to insect herbicide these are all various qualities that are imparted through the insertion of genes soya bean is uh, herbicide tolerant high oil quality these are all you know modified for these traits cotton is another one papaya is another one disease resistant and golden rice is recently approved and now two years back and now it is grown in philippines it is with the high vitamin a content and so on <clears throat> actually there are more than uh, you know about 20 crops which are approved globally which includes fruits vegetables but major focus is on these commodity crops because of your sector the livestock sector also which uses high high quantity of uh, uh, maize and soybean uh, for various uh, sectors and also the cotton and must canola which is like a like mustard our mustard is uh, the one which is uh, genetically modified and grown in very large area about 190 million hectares this picture is from a report and they they tell you know that where all what crops are used and as you can see many countries you know uh, have been using this now one of the very important point to note here is that whichever country these crops were introduced almost the adoption rate by farmers is more than 90% so in india cotton was introduced so we have 94% of cotton area under bt cotton which is a approved crop similarly brazil argentina us canada there you know wherever the soya bean was introduced Uh, the adoption rate is ninety percent. So, what is the end result? Is that almost uh, you know eighty percent of the soya bean grown around the world is genetically modified soya bean, and all the meal or the oil that we import uh, finally is GM is derived from the GM soya bean. So, but in India we have only one crop, which is the BT cotton, as I said, and the high adoption rate. Adoption of uh, G, uh, BT cotton uh, helped us. triple our cotton production uh, from 2003 to 2021 and uh, then you know it also helped in the reduced insecticide sprays and in parallel what is of interest to you is the increased production of cotton seed and its by products oil and meal so the availability of the meal from the cotton seed meal increased three times because of the adoption of this crop in india in addition to this beauty cotton and as i mentioned uh, that uh, last uh, on 25th october uh, the, the government has approved approved genetically modified mustard uh, but it will take by developed by the university but it will take about 2 uh, years before the seed is actually produced and it reaches to the farmers 
So uh, in addition to that, soya bean oil, canola oil, cotton seed oil, these are all approved for use. Cotton seed meal, as I mentioned, is used. So I mean, meal was permitted. There are some other applications which are, you know, uh, still under consideration, and that includes includes DDGS. So oil uh, derived from is there is no you now why is oil uh, approved? You know, oil is approved because the opinion is that there is no DNA or protein in the crops. But it is a point to be noted is that genetically modified derived feed products also do not contain any living organism. You know, they cannot propagate and have any, any damage to the environment and so on as, as a, you know, uh, apprehension of certain uh, people. And even in the international agreements, they are considered as non-living mod uh, modified organisms and are exempted from biosafety regulations in most countries. And that is how you saw that US is able to, you know, import, export uh, so much so, so much quantities to other uh, countries. Now, coming to the all these products, that their use is regulated, and uh, we have this Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change, which implements uh, certain rules, which are for the manufacture, use, import, export. So all activities are regulated, and Ministry of Environment does this with the help of uh, Department of Biotechnology and the states. There are quite a few committees under that, but the point to be noted here is that genetic engineering appraisal committee, you might see in the popular press also, GIAC has approved, GIAC has rejected and so on. So this is what this committee is, which gives the final approval for products. Now our rules, you know, they cover both the living modified organisms and products thereof. But subsequently with the regulation of GM foods, a uh, new regime coming in through the Food Safety Act, the draft regulations, it is now, it may later be under Food Safety Authority, but the draft rules are under preparation. Now, coming to the specific question that we have seen in the chat box and which comes to our mind, what is the regulation of DDGS derived from GM crops in India? If the GM crop is cultivated in India, all products derived from the same are treated in the same way as those from non-GM crops. So no further approval is required. Example is the cottonseed meal. So nobody goes to the regulator saying that I want to use cotton seed meal. When the approval for cotton was given, it included the approval for all its products. If not, then permission is required for use of products derived from GM crops. Therefore, in India, as per our regulations, we need permission to import and use of DDGS derived from GM corn if we wish to. Now, the, the issues that come in the mind, you know, after hearing to uh, so many speakers, all the speakers, they showed the detailed process. You see, DDGS is highly processed. Ethanol production, no yeast, nothing survives. It is 100%, you know, the, sorry, 100, it's up to boiling of that uh, broth which happens and a very high temperature. And finally, at the end, you do not have any living modified organisms. You also, it's like a living, it's a, like a powder after drying. If at all there was any genetic modification and some proteins were expressed, which have already been assessed as safe, they are still inactivated. So virtually we have no biosafety issues and the properties of DDGS, whether derived from GM or non-GM, corn or any other crop would be same. So it is, you know, we as a biotechnologists and as a user community, see, I mean, representing what we heard from the all these uh, four or five events that we did and where large number of people participated. So immediately the question comes that why is it regulated? So there is actually a need for exemption of such products from the rules 1989 and uh, similar approvals have actually been granted for the import of oils. So this would also fall under some the same category, but then industry has to, you know, approach and uh, the regulators and, you know, the producers have to approach and the so on so on and so forth. So very quickly, this is my last slide. I would also like to reiterate here that GM crops are commercially cultivated and traded across the world. The number of crops and area has increased steadily since the introduction of first crop. 71 countries use these crops for feeding. The growing is about 30, but feeding is by 71. We have very good regulations in place, but there is a need for extensive research and field testing and streamlining the approval procedures for cultivation, import, and use. All is required. We need to have our own capacity. We need to have our own research. 
so that you know the wheat industry gets very good quality corn. I was reading the chat box and all through the issue of mycotoxins quality and so on is there. So there is an urgent need for required for exploring the use of these crops for meeting the requirements of feed industry. Thank you very much. This is what I wanted to share about the GM crops. And I hope um, uh, I have made it clear uh, the, the, the need for moving forward and um, exploiting the you know, potential that these crops have for the feed industry. Uh, thank you. And um, I think this was the last presentation in our program. And we would now move on to, as I said, the, the event, you know, has been co-organized, co jointly organized with the very esteemed uh, industry associations. Uh, it is the uh, CLEFMA, Karnataka Poultry Farmers Breeders Association, All India Poultry Breeders Association, and Broiler Coordination Committee. So I have with me here on the panel, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Neeraj Srivastava. Actually, Dr. Datta is traveling in the program, so I will just try to connect with him. He's in Arunachal Pradesh. So we have Mr. Neeraj Srivastava here. Uh, sir, you heard all the presentations and also the must have been following the, uh, the what was uh, discussed in the chat box. So uh, I would like to request you being the leading feed manufacturers association, how do you think DDGS can bridge the gap in supply and demand of nutritious, high quality feed from, for different sectors. You know, we heard poultry and dairy, and we also heard the international perspective from aqua, uh, use in the aqua sector. So, uh, and one more point that I would like to dwell upon is that presently, uh, you know, we, we heard that India, it is mainly rice, uh, but the government has given, you know, through those uh, Niti Aayog, uh, and other uh, reports, we permitted both corn and broken rice for the use in ethanol production. So in future, both would be available. So I would like to hear from you, your viewpoint on, uh, you know, uh, on these points. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Auja. I think it was a great presentation. Uh, I picked up uh, some of the points from Dr. Patavi presentation and Dr. Natarajan. Uh, I think I'm coming back to your question, actually. So today, if you see that uh, the DDGS is an effective and currently most important raw material search for animal feed, okay, including poultry, dairy, and aqua. And I could see a lot of interest from the participant asking so many questions about availability, quality, and all. Uh, what I picked up there that uh, this DDGS is uh, really going to be useful because of is moderate to high level of crude protein. And in general, uh, CP contents ranges, I, see, I saw that I was a little disappointed to see some numbers in the uh, US imported this about 27-28%, uh, but I could see that, yeah, this goes up to even 60%, 28-60%, to 60%, depending on the type of processing. And the fat, I could I could make out about 6-10%. to 10 and moderate to high digestibility of amino acid, uh, which is going to make it more viable in the feed formulation. And uh, eventually it has really helped to reduce the feed cost. Uh, what I could make out from the team presentation is that some of the major advantages, uh, this is one of the desirable replacement of soya DOC, a uh, mage. Uh, and, and we all knew that last year we suffered uh, with the availability of soya DOC. And uh, another interesting point, I could see that the uses of uh, this particularly. So dairy, I think uh, I was thinking that up to 15% can be used, but in one of the presentation, I saw that even it can be used up to 20%. While in broiler and the poultry layer, it was the uh, maximum level to be used was, was the 10%. And it's at the same time, it's a good source of available phosphorus. I heard very nicely, top three costliest uh, nutrients is energy protein and the phosphorus. And at least I, I think DDGS is going to address all these three. Uh, phosphorus level is very, very similar to maize and amino acid profile is also, uh, I can say that uh, uh, similar to maize. I found that uh, one very interesting part that the, the higher level of methionine than soya DOC makes DDGS even more attractive. And in, in addition to that, in dairy, the aroma of DDGS makes it more palatable. 
and due to its less starch content compared to maize, its inclusion in advantageous in aqua feed. And uh, I see that uh, it's also shown to improve palating quality with a reduction in the dust and the fines in the feed mill. Uh, I think this is going to make DDGS much more attractive as a raw material and uh, to be used in the Indian uh, feed mill industry. Uh, if I see 45 million metric ton of the feed production and on an average uses around 10 to 15 percent, it's going to make us more than 6 to 7 million of the uh, DDGS uses opportunity in the country. Uh, another challenge what I see that and which you have asked about the uh, GM corn DDGS acceptability in the India. So I think there were a lot of uh, targets given and even government is supporting to produce ethanol and from molasses, the new things have come up, the broken rice and the maize. But my, my surprise is that where is the maize available to produce ethanol in the country? Because we are still uh, struggling to use the right quantity of the maize for the producing the animal feed in the country. Even the starch production is going up. And uh, I strongly see that the only alternate and the option is going to be the GM crop availability in the country. And uh, Indian feed industry is going to be highly benefited if we can move towards that direction. The great news came sometimes back a week and all that government has allowed for GM mustard. I'm strongly looking for that the day which government is going to announce for the GM soya and the GM maize. That will be a real help, support, and revolution for the animal feed industry, actually. My only request at this moment is, because I heard from uh, Dr. Geeta, as well as the poll, uh, some of the uh, Mr. Patel from the Sabar Dairy, and other some of the questions where the concern of quality and consistency, I think the both is being talked about. And this was very clearly mentioned by our both nutritionists who presented in the country, Dr. Patabi and Dr. Natarajan, mycotoxin challenges there. So the, the producers in India at this moment, I think they should look into this. The opportunity for this particular DDGS in the country is huge. If they can just improve the quality and give a consistent supplies, I think this can be one of the best options. We saw a fantastic quality and, and with the zero uh, level of uh, T2 toxin, very lower level of Afla and Dawn, very, very acceptable from the US import. I wish that we could have the same quality of what US is producing today, where 90% of carne is coming from the GM, being exported more than 55 countries. I think if that situation is going to be in India, we, it will be really a great benefit to our Indian uh, animal feed industry. So that's my views, Dr. Viva. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your views. Uh, we have with us Mr. Suresh Chitani. He is the, from All India Poultry Breeders Association. Uh, sir could not join uh, uh, earlier because he was busy in a very important meeting. So I'll quickly like to brief you, sir. We had a very good presentations from Dr. Natarajan and other uh, speakers, international perspective also. And one of the issues which has come in the chat box and also, uh, you know, came up was that there is a need for a consistent uh, quality. And as uh, Neeraj sir also said, so good quality grain is very important. And uh, it is highly, and I, I, in my last presentation, I presented that DDGS is highly processed. And therefore, in most countries, it's use, that use, import, export, etc. No activities are actually subjected to the biosafety regulations and no differentiation between the GM and non-GM uh, derived corn DDGS globally. Though we have, uh, like sir also mentioned that uh, presently DDGS from rice, but uh, corn and broken uh, rice have also been permitted. So continuing with what Neeraj sir said, you know, we would also like to hear from you, your views on this uh, grain-based ethanol production and how the adoption of GM crops could actually uh, help in fulfilling the nutri nutrient needs of the livestock sector. What do you think? Yeah, thanks Dr. Viba. So, uh, 
as i've said earlier also in many occasions right uh, gm non gm doesn't matter to us you know we just need uh, the crop uh, i think i i my video if i switch it on i think my bandwidth is not very good but i'll still try i don't know if you can hear me Okay, thank you, well, sir. Please continue. Okay, good. Yeah. So, and you know, as far as the DDGS uh, or maize uh, for the chicken, and it it does not matter GM non GM. What matters is cost of production, right? For point one, point two. Uh, I know lot of breeders and in the sense integrators in Bangladesh are using DDGS today in in uh, broilers. So, and and they're doing quite well. So it it. It, it it works quite well of course the formula has to change whatever it is but that is well settled and i also was speaking to the second largest uh, chicken processor in the world and they almost exclusively use G ddgs only in their system that's what they told us is that you know of course they add a certain enzyme and all that but they said the reason for their profitability is that they only use ddgs they don't use any soya so the, and this is the second largest processor in the world uh you know after jbs so it's not a small company it's it's a huge company who are probably processing more than entire india produces broiler i'm talking he's only processing that much so that's how big he is so so it's absolutely works and that has been proven in india yes we have a uh, the existing suppliers whoever they are there have a very bad reputation on consistency and quality so that is what we are scared of that is our experience that is what we are very scared of about is the quality and consistency right and and ddgs again is not like soya is soya right there is no discussion on it there is no you can't call sunflower soya but ddgs actually is that ddgs sources can be from rice can be maize and like dr natarajan yesterday was saying could be jowar also so based on the uh, raw material used there is cert, there are definitely differences in the the protein content of each ddgs right so that is so that is something that we have to understand so uh, so other than that uh, dr viba and others my research so far and and i have gone and spoken to some very big people around the world there is absolutely no problem in using ddgs if yes we are because of our experience present experience in north india and certain places we are very very worried about toxins and quality right that that we are worried about that's because of our existing experience like but now if you see the sopa guys the soya, soya processors and all that have done a great job you know of they declared their standards and and they are uh, you know they went the industry got together and did a good job of giving us certain assurances and all that about quality uh, and i think the distiller is also will have to learn and do that otherwise yeah you know they can, just cannot um, or they will essentially the product will become because it's only cheap some guys will some people will buy it because it is really cheap sorry not cheap it has to be really cheap if you are trying to sell low quality product and i don't know if dairy can is can better handle extremely low quality ddgs than chickens can but we know chickens cannot uh, really handle extremely low quality by that i mean if the toxins and all that are very high um which again my understanding is is because of the process how they do drying and all that mostly that is the problem and maybe it's also could be a problem of the input being bad then the output will be bad so it's possible that is also there i'm not i'm not done that much research on this uh but other than that uh, dr viba i think uh, if everything is handled pro properly it is fantastic it will help the poultry industry explode if uh, because today we are challenged by our uh, uh, very high ingredient costs and luckily for them uh, the sopa guys and all that are not very ambitious they don't want to you know they are not looking at expanding you know they are stuck on gm non gm and all that whatever it is right maybe it's a good competitive advantage for the ddgs guys uh, and and i i feel uh, government definitely has to now look at gm uh because uh, it helps the uh, rice farmers or corn farmers to multiply their productivity per acre so that will make it cheaper and bigger opportunity 
and that will help dairy and poultry industry to expand more because when if we can be more competitive we can export tremendously that's a huge opportunity again so this is my take so far viva i don't know if i missed anything thank you no, thank you so much sir uh, just continuing with what you said you know quality and consistency is the key things we have with us now dr mbln raju who is the principal scientist in nutrition from the directorate of poultry research and uh, dr raju is from as i said the lead research institution of poultry sector he has been engaged in research also regarding this uh, quality and also he chairs the pis panel on animal products where the bureau of indian standards is actually trying to uh, has initiated some um, activity for ensuring you know for developing the standards which would help in making available the consistent quality for the users so we would like to hear from dr raju now thank you dr vibha yes. good evening everyone so for the last couple of hours we have been uh, discussing about this material raw material and uh, from the first two presentations itself we could know like uh, this is a very valuable alternate material now it has come uh, as a handy uh, substitute for soybean and uh, i think this is uh, the hope for uh, yeah future poultry is increasing and aqua is also increasing uh -huh. okay mirenas So yeah, why, and uh, right. the and uh, yes, uh, it was also pointed out uh, the agriculture is growing at only less than two percent, at around two percent, whereas the livestock sector is growing at eight to ten percent. Naturally, the feed requirement is going up, and uh, in that background, in that scenario, this has come as a, a very promising material and highly nutritious because whatever the grain that is used, much of the starch is. Uh, used in the fermentation process uh, in the ethanol production so the left out all the other nutrients will be naturally rising the nutrient levels in the uh, material that is uh, as coming as a by product so many uh, everyone almost everyone unanimously agrees on one point uh, that is the one main concern for this uh, material is the consistency lack of consistency in the material that is being available in the country and uh, uh, like some time back we analyzed the uh, samples uh, drawn from different corners of the country the uh, protein itself varied from 44 to 62% is all based on rice only so this shows i'm not talking in uh, again all the amino acids and all that so the basic uh, protein itself uh, there is so much of variation in fact i would have uh, love to have some producer here like now who's already producing ethanol and then selling uh, ddgs in the country so those people also should have been uh, like now because everyone agrees like the ddgs is an excellent material so the pro problem is only with the production process and now it is high time uh, for us to sensitize all those uh, plants which are actually producing ethanol because it is not a just a, a throw away material just like a manure it is not being just thrown out so it is a valuable uh, uh, raw material for livestock and poultry and aqua so they, that sector has to be sensitized i think that is the need of the hour now if that quality uh, consistency can be ensured definitely i think the uh, levels whatever that have been now given when our experience also is limiting uh, the use beyond some uh, level like 8 to 10% if not go beyond that so those things can be lifted so yeah. once the quality is ensured and uh, basically i think uh, the plants use different kinds of designs and then the drying process is different and also the the proportion of solubles that are added back to the grains so that is not uniform so th that all influences the quality of the raw material so i think uh, now the like the cloth plasma and then maybe everyone concerned with uh, the production of uh, the livestock sector in the country so they have to sensitize these producers to take care of this quality uh, aspect of this material and then uh, uh, like no, presently it is 10% ethanol in the fuel and the government policy by 2025 is going to be 20% naturally you have to have that much of uh, ethanol produced locally in the country so naturally the ddgs availability is going to shoot it is going to be many like at least double uh, in couple of years or more than a little around that 
So if we can ensure this quality, definitely the uh, livestock, poultry, and aqua sector will benefit a lot. That is my thing. And uh, uh, about the GM, importation of GM material, I think last year, government of India has permitted uh, soybean meal importation into the country. 1.2 million tons permission was given, and a lot of material also was imported. So to my knowledge, about 0.8 million tons was imported. So I, at that time, this point came like uh, that soybean might be GM. And uh, then uh, that was uh, uh, the authorities could be convinced saying that this is destructed, this is not, the, not the seed is not being imported and uh, there is no living uh, material in that. So the same way I think DDGS should also have a possibility of uh, importation without much problem. Only thing is the appropriate authorities and the ministries have to be convinced with this. That's all since uh, I think people are leaving. So I, 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 I just uh, think of it. Thank, thank you very you much. So much sir. Thank you. And uh, thanks to everyone for their such a lively discussion. And we have a lot of uh, questions which have come up. Like you said, you know, interaction with the distillers. And I have been actually in one of the meetings, you know, uh, with such. And I don't think they were sensitive to, they, they were probably not visualizing that all this is also going to be big issues. So definitely such interactions and such, uh, uh, you know, knowledge sharing with both uh, at the national and international level is required. And with the support of all those who are involved, particularly, I would like to thank Neeraj sir, Suresh sir, Dr. Sushant Rai, Dr. Naveen, Mr. Naveen, and everyone who, Mr. Ram Kutti ji, everyone who supported and uh, came forward to that, you know, yes, this kind of knowledge sharing is required. And... Uh, uh, you please continue with this and uh, we will definitely continue and take note of all these points. We'll answer the question and answers which were uh, raised also with the help of experts and get back to people. With this, I think I would like to once again thank everyone to all the participants and speakers and close the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.